This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here at the Coffee League, found at thecoffeeleague.com. Uh, my guest today, Elizabeth Teague. She's the Social and Environmental Performance Manager at Root Capital. Uh, Root Capital uh, works with uh, in uh, mostly third world countries, uh, working with uh, providing um, financing uh, to uh, help small farmers uh, and uh, people break into those markets. Uh, they serve as an agricultural business that connects small farm holders to world markets as well. So thank you so very much for coming on, taking the time to come on today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so first question is, uh, what percentage of your clients are actually involved in coffee farming? At this time, about 50% of our clients are involved in coffee. And just to clarify, so our direct clients are businesses. So they're not the farmers themselves, but they're farmer cooperatives, associations, or even private enterprises that source from smallholder farmers. Right. Um, so about 50% of those are, are coffee businesses. And then each business is sourcing from anywhere from a few dozen or a few hundred coffee farmers to mm -hmm. tens of thousands of coffee farmers. Tell us about those cooperatives and what they do to uh, assist the farmers. Yeah, so I think um, one thing that was surprising to me when I first got into this space is realizing that the bulk of the world's coffee farmers are actually smallholders. They're small farmers who, you know, the numbers can vary from country to country, but maybe are farming on around um, five hectares of land. And so these farmers might not be able to directly access markets themselves. They need some sort of intermediary to help them do that. Mm -hmm. um, so in many of oh, sorry go ahead yeah. in in many of these markets there are intermediaries who are who sometimes take advantage of farmers and don't give them the best market price and so in many cases particularly in Latin America farmers basically came together and formed their own cooperatives so that they could pool their resources um, get access to better prices get access to markets and also um, provide services such as technical assistance um, credit things of that nature throughout the coffee season. And, and then uh, who controls those cooperatives? Who generally uh, are the folks that come in and create those cooperatives? So the cooperatives are um, their member organizations. So it's the farmers themselves who form up the membership of the cooperative and the directing board. Um, and there can be different processes from place to place, but that's generally an elected board. Um, that rotates over from time to time. And there will be some sort of a professional manager, but really it's it's the farmers themselves that are running the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my understanding is that one of the uh, issues that small farmers have to deal with, a big problem for them, is price volatility. Is that the case? And what can be done to uh, stabilize that? Yes, yeah, so there is a lot of price volatility in the coffee market. Uh, coffee is a publicly traded um, commodity. And so there's a lot of speculation that, that goes into the, the pricing. Um, cooperatives in partnership with buyers, um, direct trade buyers or fair trade buyers can gain some control over the price they get. They can, they can um, basically create forward contracts with their buyers and their buyers will commit to a certain um, price floor or certain, you know, fixed price um, at the time of the harvest. And that way they can have some protection from the volatility. Um, but even a lot of um, what I would say are the more enlightened buyers who are really trying to get the best price possible for the farmers, even they are somewhat constrained um, by the market, which is called the C price. Um, mm -hmm. They have to respond to that in some way as well. Now, uh, when, when I go into a coffee shop and I see free trade uh, or fair trade or uh, whatever, whatever they might post up and I, and I get the feeling that, okay, the farmers in, in Central South America or uh, Eastern Africa are being treated fairly, uh, should I believe that when I read it, or what should I look for uh, to make sure that uh, I'm supporting a, 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 a cafe, an industry that's actually not exploiting these farmers? Yeah, no, I think it's certainly confusing with um, the number of certifications and standards that are out there. Um, what I would say is certifications like Fair Trade, um, like Organic, like Rainforest Alliance, like OITS, um, all of them have slightly different requirements that they're looking for, but all of them follow a rigorous process of doing a diagnostic with the business, um, doing audits every year to make sure the business is meeting those standards. Um, certainly there are cases where, where things fall through the cracks, but what I've seen is in general, um, 
certification is getting a lot of good done. I buy certified coffee myself. I believe right. in it. Um, now, now explain, and I think explain that a little better. What, when I, if I go buy, buy a, a bag of coffee, if I go to a roast, if I buy it online, and you say certified, what, what should I look for to make, uh, to make sure that I'm supporting fair trade? Uh, what, what, when you say certification, what certification? Well, there are a number of certifications that fall under the umbrella of fair trade that are looking at social issues, um, so good performance for employees, fair prices for farmers, also fair wages for employees. Fair Trade International is one that's, I think, widely recognized. Um, fair Trade USA, um, which split out from Fair Trade International, is another. There are others um, that are more in the European market that, again, they have slightly different names and slightly different things that they focus on, but they would also fall under the umbrella of fair trade. Um, so I think all of all of these standards are publicly available. You can actually read through them if you really want to <laughs> dig uh -huh. deep and know what you're buying. And I would encourage consumers that are really interested to just take some time. It wouldn't take that much time to mm -hmm. download the standards and get a sense of what they actually include. Now, uh, I, I know you've worked in Japan. You've worked in other countries. Uh, what are the issues that uh, you are concerned with in regard to organics, GMOs, sustainability? What are some of the key issues that are being dealt with now? And I know uh, uh, I've discussed it with others. Uh, uh, global, uh, cl I mean, climate change having a big impact on, on on coffee farming. So it's a big umbrella of issues. But what are some of the things that you're focused on now? Yeah, I think um, so. Two things. So one, root capital is an impact investor. So that means that when we're looking. Mm -hmm. Um, to potential borrowers, businesses that we will lend money to, we want to understand the business case, but we also want to make sure that those businesses are using responsible practices, um, particularly and related to, um, to the environment and to the, their relationship with farmers. And so there we're looking at a range of issues, again, fair pricing, fair treatment for employees, um, we're looking for generally sustainable environmental practices, so appropriate use of wastewater, appropriate use of chemicals if they are using them. Um, so first, we have that, that screen, um, and, and that's part of my responsibility to look, look at all of those issues. Um, but I'd say more broadly, once we have identified these businesses that are doing really well, we want to think about how can we better support them in dealing with some of these new challenges. Um, particularly climate change, particularly mm -hmm. for coffee. That's something that is really concerning. Um, it looks like it's really going to change the face of the, the sector over the next several decades, and we want to make sure that smallholders aren't left out during that transition, or if they need to leave coffee, that they can, they can do that in a way that um, allows them good options. Are, are GMOs uh, used in, in coffee growing? Honestly, I'm not well positioned to answer that question. Um, I'm not a GMO expert. Mm -hmm. I have not heard of any GMOs being used. Generally, the focus is much more on conventional breeding. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a great group called um, World Coffee Research that you, that would, could give you a lot more information. They focus on coffee genetics, coffee varietals. Right. I, I should mention we had uh, uh, Joanna Neuschwander on from World Coffee Research, and uh, oh, so, great. Yeah. But, that, that, that's also posted up. People should listen to that, uh, get that angle. All right, tell us about uh, Root Capital, how they came into being and how they are funded. Sure. So Root Capital started in 1999. Um, our founder and still current CEO is a man named Willie Foote, who came from the finance industry and then kind of wanted, wanted to do a little something different and took a year or two off to do actually a financial journalism fellowship in Central America and Mexico. And there he ended up talking to a lot of coffee farmers mm -hmm. and other farmers, but particularly coffee, and just hearing their issues around access to finance, that basically there was no access to finance or not in the amounts they needed or that wasn't predatory. And so as a former finance guy, that got him really thinking, you know, this is clearly, this is a big market failure. What could we do to potentially solve this market failure. And so that was the impetus for Root Capital, um, which again started in 99 and really focused on developing very tailored loan products for farmer cooperatives in Central America. And from there, we spread to South America and Africa and now Asia as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Elizabeth, what brought you to Root Capital? What, where did you start and, and how did you find yourself there? So I got really interested in agriculture um, right after college. <laughs> I kind mm -hmm. of missed the opportunity in college. And so I had the opportunity to work as a, um, as a farmhand, essentially, for a sustainable agriculture training center in Japan. Um, it's a Japanese nonprofit that invites rural leaders from Africa, other parts of Asia, to come and live on this farm campus for nine months in Japan um, and learn all about organic closed-loop agriculture. So that, for me, was really, was really a powerful experience. It really got me interested in agriculture, particularly um, improving food systems. And so when I came back to the United States, that's what I was looking for, and I kind of I found Root Capital. I knew nothing about impact investing. I knew nothing about finance, but I was really drawn to the mission of improving food systems and getting smallholder farmers better integrated into international food systems in a way that actually benefited them. Mm -hmm. And I, I read the angle that Root Capital takes is threefold, finance, advise, and catalyze. Uh, do you want to explain those mm -hmm. to us? Yeah. Sure. So our primary service started as, as finance, as loans for these businesses. Within about five years of starting, we realized that for many of these businesses, finance itself wasn't the only constraint. It was often the business capacity to take advantage of that finance. And so we mm -hmm. started up what we called an advisory arm, which is basically financial or business training for businesses. So very customized, you know, we send trainers out into the field, they spend a week with businesses and, and help them work on whatever they need to work on. Um, so those are our two service arms. And then the last piece, Catalyze, is the idea that, you know, one organization is not going to solve this problem, that this is a huge market failure and will probably require um, different approaches. And so... A lot of our work is sharing our learning, sharing our sharing information that we have with others who might then be interested in doing what we do in another market or taking mm -hmm. what we do and building on it and doing something that's better adjusted to their context. Yeah. Now, Root Capital, <clears throat> does their funding come from donations? They're a nonprofit uh, or, do they, or is it investors? Because it's, it looks like you're giving a loan and you have a very good re repayment uh, uh, rate on, on loans that are given out. So I'm just wondering if it's set up as a, an investment vehicle, which would, I guess, make it not a nonprofit, but since it's a nonprofit, I would think more it's donation. How does that work? Yeah, it's a little bit of a funky structure. So we are a nonprofit, um, we, but we take on both donations and investment. And so all the loans that we give out are investments that we take on as an organization. We manage that on our balance sheet, so it's not a, it's not a separate fund. It's technically on our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and then we use donations to, um, to do kind of supporting work around that. So the business training I mentioned is funded by donations. Um, our work around impact evaluation to understand the impact of our work, that's also funded by donations. So we have this hybrid structure. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, what is like an average loan? What type of, of, of funding uh, it, it goes to these small farmers that have maybe four or five hectares? So an average loan to a cooperative or a private enterprise is around $400,000. Um, mm -hmm. That's often a loan that's used to take in the harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so basically to fill that gap between when the cooperative needs to pay farmers for their coffee and when the cooperative in turn gets paid by its buyer. Mm -hmm. And and what are some of the major obstacles you run into aside from like climate change, uh, but uh, you know person-made uh, obstacles? Is, is it corrupt governments? Is it uh, uh, bureaucracies? Is there what are the sorts of things you run into that uh, can sometimes frustrate what you want to do? Yeah, and um, there are. Um... I'd say a lot of the issues we've seen recently are more on the environmental side. Um, so, for example, two years ago, we had the strongest El Nino cycle on record, and mm -hmm. that really impacted some of our businesses, particularly in Colombia, where there was massive rain and massive flooding, and the, co the cooperative literally couldn't get the coffee to market. Like It couldn't mm -hmm. get it down from the mountains to the port. Um, so those are more of the issues that we've seen recently, but certainly like with any sector, any businesses, there, there are some issues of management where management is weak, 
Um, and sometimes, you know, things don't go to plan, particularly with these environmental issues and price volatility, and maybe the cooperative can't fulfill its contract and then can't um, pay back the loan on time. And so in, in those cases, we work with the business to try to understand what are the circumstances, how could we work together to, to together go through this crisis um, rather than just, you know, leaving the business in the dust. Mm -hmm. and, and then w what about, uh, and, and I, I always wonder this, I mean, in, in these countries where there are small farmers, uh, does a time come when the, the big guys come along and buy them out and then uh, the, the small farmer is sort of pushed to the side or, uh, you know, not given the deal they should have been given and that sort of thing? Or, or you, how do you keep it uh, so that it's a, it continues to be uh, small farms? So we ourselves aren't necessarily trying to, to keep farms a certain size or keep farmers mm -hmm. in a certain place. Um, it's more we're trying to reach these rural communities that haven't had as much of a chance historically. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some cases, we, we want to see that, that business, that farmers become more prosperous and maybe buy more land. You know, probably still that would make them a seven hectare farmer, not you know, a okay. 50, 100 hectare farmer. Mm -hmm. um, but but, but are, there, heard, are there farmers that have like a thousand hectares or does that so, not so much exist in coffee? No, no, no. There, there's certainly, actually a lot of the world's coffee mm -hmm. comes from um, much larger coffee mm -hmm, farmers, mm -hmm. plantations. Um, where they are managing, you know, 500 plus hectares, and that will vary a lot based on whether you're talking about Asia or mm -hmm. Latin America or Africa. Um, and that I think that is a concern that particularly with climate change and other issues, what happens to smallholder farmers? Do they get pushed out? Um, and I think there are also questions of is land consolidation needed in some cases? Is that actually the more efficient right. option? And then what is the option for, for these, these coffee farmers? Can they go into other industries that are maybe better suited to smaller farm sizes? Do they go to the cities? Um, can governments and civil society help create a smooth transition for them if there does need to be some consolidation? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a really big question, mm -hmm. um, particularly in light of climate change. Right. Uh, you you uh, touched upon this before, but, but uh, in regard to climate change, uh, what kinds of things are you seeing uh, that are affecting coffee farmers? And also, my understanding is that the, and I, I, I know that the demand for specialty, what we could consider specialty coffee, has gone way up, and that these problems with climate change, and I'd like you to just reflect on those, uh, how they will in, affect the s supply and demand. W will we reach a point where that demand can no longer be supplied? Yes, and, and actually on that point, just to clarify, I've really been talking basically exclusively about Arabica, specialty coffee, right. that's what we work. We don't, we don't really right. work in Robusta. Um, so I think some of, the, some of the things we've been hearing um, that are already impacting farmers around climate change, definitely drought, um, particularly in mm -hmm. Central America, which is already prone to drought. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, also just kind of weirding of the weather, if you will, right. where there are, you know, very unusual fluctuations in temperatures and precipitation patterns that really impact the coffee tree. The coffee mm -hmm. tree relies on certain patterns, particularly in terms of precipitation to flower, to set the fruit correctly, et cetera. And if that, if that changes, then the coffee plant gets confused and it will flower at the wrong time, which means you don't get as many cherries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, there are a number of challenges and they play out differently in, in different contexts, but I'd say drought and, and just fluctuations in the weather um, are the two biggest. Um, sorry, I forgot your third question. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, just the, the, the concern. I mean, people oh, listen Rubita. in. These are, uh, a lot of people that will listen to, to my broadcast will be people that really enjoy coffee, especially what we call specialty coffee, third wave coffee. And that, uh, you know, should they feel, look, uh, we may reach a point where we can't get what we want because the farmers can't grow enough because there's, you know, we have Central America, South America, Eastern Africa, certain places where this is grown. And, and if those places uh, become such that, uh, you, you know, they can't produce what they need to produce, uh, we may not be able to get the product we want. Uh, is that a real concern they yeah. should have? Yeah, I think that is a concern, and I think that is something that the the coffee, the specialty coffee industry, is starting to talk about 
more and more. I think one, a, a few glimmers of hope is that even if the amount of land that's suitable to specialty Arabica coffee declines, there's actually a real opportunity on the remaining land, on existing land, to increase production, mm -hmm. um, particularly at the smallholder level. Farmers are producing way below what is possible for a number of factors. Mm -hmm. um, and so with more support, um, perhaps also with a better market signal, <laughs> a right, better price right. signal, they could, um, they could increase production. Um, there's also, you mentioned you spoke with World Coffee Research. There's some really interesting research going on around um, new varieties that would be better adapted to new climates. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think there is some hope, but it will require action. It will require really concerted action. And I think um, in part probably a push from consumers too to say we want we want this industry to continue. We want right. um, you know, maybe we need to pay higher prices to make that happen. Right. And, and I read, I mean, I read that you know, you've gotten funding and support from Starbucks, from Green Mountain Roasters, uh, also from the Bill uh, uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Skull Foundation. So you, you've had some major players come in and, and some within the industry, some uh, that are just dealing with farm in, ge in, in general that obviously uh, see that there's a real problem and, and a deep concern. Certainly, if the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation has gotten involved with you, uh, they, they do their homework, I know. And uh, uh, this is something that should be a concern. And then that, and that we might have to see uh, specialty coffee prices go up uh, for the industry uh, to continue. But uh, now, are you hopeful for the future of coffee growth or, or, is, uh, or are you pessimistic at this point? <laughs> I know you I have to I'm... say you're optimistic, but I'm wondering, uh, yeah, is that optimism based in I'm reality? Yeah. Optimistic. yeah. No, I think I'm cautiously optimistic. And one reason is, you know, I would, I would say I'm, Root Capital is, we're, we're in the coffee world, but we're also outside, you know, we're not in the value chain. We're, we're an organization that supports the value chain. Yeah. So we have a little bit of an outside perspective. But what I've seen from the coffee um, conferences that I've been to just in the past year is climate change productivity, pricing for farmers, these are all top issues on every agenda. Mm -hmm. um, I think the answers are still a little bit unclear, but I'm certainly encouraged to see such the number of organizations and businesses that are engaged on this issue and the number of really great people that I know that are in the coffee value chain that are really thinking hard about this issue. So yes, right. I would say I'm but, but there are a lot of challenges, but I'm optimistic because of that. Well, that, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And then for anybody who wants to find out more about Root Capital, go to Root, R-O-O-T, capital, C-A-P-T, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, dot org, not dot com, but uh, rootcapital.org. I uh, have a very thorough uh, uh, website, has a lot of information, and we'll bring you up to date on these things. And if you're a consumer of coffee like me and enjoy coffee, these are things uh, you need to be concerned about. And if the price goes up, uh, you'll at least have some understanding why. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you so very much for your time, Elizabeth. Any uh, final thoughts you'd like to share with us? No. Um, okay. I, guess my, I guess my final thought would just be, yeah, keep, keep buying coffee. <laughs> um, and I think now it's easier than ever to find information, find out information about what the business is, what the farmer is, what the chal what challenges they're facing. So I would encourage people to go out and look for some of those stories because it's really fascinating stuff. Great. Thank you so very much for your time. Thanks very much.